Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first off, again, welcome and thank you so much for joining this session on women in trades. We are really happy to have this be our inaugural session of 20 webinar of 2021 for Women's History Month. And um, we're really excited to have you and all of our panelists with us today. Um, and I thank you so, so much for attending and for participating. Um, my name is Jessica Fell, Preservation Initiatives Manager at Preservation Islands. I just need to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the good stuff. Um, like I said, this is our first 2021 session. Um, we did have a series of webinars over the course of 2020, and we plan to continue uh, to have more webinars into 2021. Our next session will be in partnership with the Council for Maryland Archaeology um, on, uh, in April. And so I encourage you to go to our website, which is oldlinestatesummit.org and check out um, a few sessions and you can all get recordings of past sessions um, and look at all the good content there. I also wanna thank our sponsors, uh, Whitey Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester Eisenbrandt, Brennan and Company, the Rural Maryland Council, Rough Roofers, and the Middendorf Foundation. Our sponsors make it possible for us to present these free of charge. Um, and we really, really do thank them for their support. Um, so before I hand this over to Natalie, I am going, I just want to go over a couple little um, tech issues. So first, I just want to remember how you can ask questions. Um, any point during the presentation, or certainly at the end, um, you can enter a question into the question box in your controls. Um, and at the end of the session, um, we'll have time to ask the panelists the questions that have been entered into the question box. Um, and if we have so many we can't get through them all, um, you know, we can also um, I can email them to the panelists and, and get uh, answers afterwards. Um, and finally, this session is being recorded and uh, we will be sharing that recording with all of you in an email you can expect over the next few days. We'll also have it up on our website. Um, it's also gonna be on our YouTube channel. So if you know someone that you'd really like to share this with, that is definitely possible. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Julie Henshaw. She is the historic uh, it's program manager here at Preservation Islands, and she just started recently, and I'm excited to have her, and I really look forward to meeting her in person someday once the pandemic is all over. Um, so, Natalie, take it away. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everybody. Like Jessica said, I'm Natalie Henshaw, um, Preservation Maryland's Historic Trades Program Manager. Thanks for being here, and thank you to your presenters for all their time and effort for being here as well. Um, in my role, I steer Preservation Maryland's initiative, the Campaign for Historic Trades. The campaign focuses on expanding historic trades training across the United States. Uh, one component of this is expanding access to training to uh, non-traditional workers. Um, the Department of Labor defines non-traditional for any group that represents less than 25% of the workforce. Under this classification, construction is a non-traditional profession for women. This is a technical term, but it is loaded with the implication that women don't work and didn't work in construction, as we probably know by the title. <laughs> this is a historically incorrect idea, uh, let alone, you know, in foraging societies, women were and are integral to the building process. And as Dr. Ralph will discuss, even in Europe and post-colonial America, women played significant roles, both on construction sites and in specialized trades. Studies have shown that when someone sees themselves represented in a profession, they are more likely to join that profession. So to that end, we have asked these three experts to discuss women in the building trades. First, we'll hear from Dr. Shelley Roth, Associate Professor at the University of Texas, San Antonio. She researches and writes about the history of women engaged in architectural design. Next, we have Lisa Sasser. She is a seasoned preservationist with a background in architecture. She plays some important trails during her years with the National Park Service and continues to advocate for women in the trades. And finally, we'll hear from Amy McCauley, expert carpenter and joiner, specializing in the use of hand tools and historic techniques, and currently the preservation joiner for Mount Vernon. And on a personal note, Amy in particular inspired me to start my own window restoration business and offered me some solid advice on how to go about doing that. Um, so I'm really pleased to have you all here. You're very inspiring to have in one place. <laughs> and with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Roth. Dr. Roth? So 
thank you for having me here. Um, this is such an exciting event and it's a project that's very dear to my heart. I'd like to introduce this topic by starting with a personal anecdote. Um, <clears throat> when I was a graduate student at Brown University, I took a seminar on medieval women in art in Europe. I had a wonderful professor and I took a seminar um, on this new hot topic of research in the spring of 1994. My background as an architect led me to ask the professor if I could write a paper on medieval women and, and architecture rather than art. Um, my slides have disappeared. Can you still see them? Why don't we have Jessica go forward with the slides? Um, we'll just start with the first one there. I'll just go ahead and start talking while you get them up. Thank you. That um, sounds great. Okay, so I wanted to write this paper on women in architecture, and I got a little bit of resistance um, for this. Um, my professor advised me to look at women patrons, meaning women who usually use the wealth of their commission um, to get a building built. Um, and the image that I'm showing you on the screen here on the left is actually from a medieval manuscript showing uh, one such patron. The noble woman in the foreground appears to be giving instructions to the craftsmen laboring on the construction side of a castle. Women patrons were indeed an interesting subject, but this is not what I wanted to do. I really wanted to write about women who were engaging in the design and construction of a building, not just being the patron. Well, I was abruptly informed that before the modern era, um, women just were not laboring on the construction site. They didn't exist, historically speaking. Um, and this really bothered me. I thought to myself, surely if women were 50% of the population, they were known to work in other trades, why not in the building trades? Was it socially taboo? I learned from a trip to the library that there were no answers to any questions I might have. I'm, a, I'm kind of a stubborn person and this fueled the fire. I set out on a mission to see if I could uncover the truth, whatever that truth might be. I harbored fantasies of finding the medieval equivalent of Rosie the Riveter, the American cultural icon that represented women who worked in factories during World War II, producing war supplies and machinery. In this case, I was actually hoping to find a couple of Rosies who were perhaps down on their luck and wanting to work on the construction site. In actuality, my fantasy of finding a medieval Rosie was not that far off from reality. In the library, I started to find clues that women did on rare occasion work on construction sites. Next slide. I found this information in the indexes and footnotes of books that were on other subjects. In other words, finding an example of a woman in this situation literally was like trying to find a proverbial needle in a haystack. However, after about 10 years and many grant funded um, research trips to archives in Europe, I was able to put together a more comprehensive picture of women's engagement in construction between the 13th and 17th centuries. Next slide. From this search, I began to develop a series of questions, which I'll, I'll just address three of them right now. First, I discovered I could ask next, when and where do we find women working on construction sites and in the building trades? Next, and what exactly were they doing? Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, why haven't we heard much about this before? Next slide. So let's talk about the when and the where. In 2010, I published my study um, of women in medieval and early modern Europe as a chapter in an edited book, Women and Wealth in Late Medieval Europe. Actually, there should be a link in the chat if you'd like a little more information that I'm gonna give in this actual talk. You know, you can refer to the book. In my search for case studies, I looked for women exclusively in Western Europe, focusing on Spain, next. The UK, next. France, next. Germany, next. And Italy. The evidence was very sporadic. 
I would sometimes find only one or two women or an entire region with no women at all. But over the years, I amassed evidence that was irrefutable. They were there. After the publication of this chapter, um, I began to find larger gangs of women working on building sites. The largest I found thus far in Valencia, Spain, where I found over 200 women working in female gangs alongside with male counterparts on the construction of city walls between the 14th and 15th centuries. Since then, Italian scholars have published on large groups of women working in early modern Rome. Next slide. So, what were they actually doing? The organization of the construction site, such as that of churches, cathedrals, palaces, and city walls, could be quite complex, and they required the management of a master of the works. Most construction projects require the timely coordination of various craftsmen's work. Usually, a large number of people had to be hired, directed, and paid. The labor directed by the master occurred both on and off the construction site. So we might wonder what actually were the women doing? In the accounting books for construction sites, I found women working in two types of situations, either on, on site as day laborers or next, off site as family members in building related craft workshops. Next, let's start with the day laborers first. Poor women and slaves worked on cathedral and church sites. Women next swept floors. Next, carried water and building materials to and around the site. And next, helped with the digging of foundation trenches. Many often arrived at the site destitute, looking for work alongside their husbands, and sometimes their children. The pay for this labor is consistent across all sites I've looked at in Europe. For the same type of work, women were always paid pretty much one half the rate of men, and children, which were usually just boys, um, were paid one quarter. Next slide, please. I'm gonna give you one example that illustrates just one type of work that the women were doing. Valencia is formerly a Muslim city conquered by a Christian king in the 13th century. The city gave incentives to Christian immigrants to come and settle in Valencia. The municipal government of Valencia needed to build new fortifications further afield that would better protect the expansion of the city. In the accounting books for the new city walls, separate gangs of men and women were recorded as being paid. Next slide. The walls that they were building were constructed of tapia. Tapia is a word that in English actually means tabby concrete. Tapia is a rammed earth wall used in Moorish construction. This kind of rammed earth construction was used um, basically in building Islamic architecture and it was used all across Spain and only later the Christians actually um, adopted it and the new Christian builders provided this method of adding bricks to it. It was a brick reinforced rammed earth construction that was much stronger, as we can see in some of the details here. Next slide. They built uh, wood frameworks in which tapia could be poured from buckets into large masonry units and left to dry. The women were transporting rubble and earth, as well as bringing carts of brick to the site. Next, please. Imagery depicting these activities are rare, um, especially from the medieval and early modern period. There are almost none. The precious set of frescoes that I'm showing you here are from the ceiling of a church in Teruel, a town not far from Valencia, which demonstrates women engaged in these activities. They are mixing mortar, carrying mortar and stones, and lifting stones with a pulley. Fortified walls and other monumental buildings in Europe were usually built of stone masonry, not tapia. However, women can be found at stone construction sites also. Next slide. Philibert de Lorme, a 16th century royal architect from the kingdom of France, was once quoted as saying, 
can anything be found which can employ and busy more people of either sex than building poor people who otherwise would have to go and beg for their bread next slide let's go ahead and address women in the building trades rather than as day laborers most work off the construction site occurred in workshops of building crafts and in the quarries clay pits or forests where materials were gathered and prepared for transportation however in family workshops the master's wife and daughters sometimes worked alongside his male journeymen and apprentices which accounts for women working in many trades which were believed to be exclusively male next slide the image that you'll see in just a moment demonstrates a medieval brick making workshop as we saw in valencia women can be found supplying building materials such as brick to construction sites in the city of seville a woman named sol martinez provided a portion of building materials to rebuild the city's arches in 1393. she was a tile and brick maker who had continued her husband's business after his death. Now we know from many court cases that are documented across Europe, court cases which banned women from working in the building trades, meaning they were, um, that widows often continued the trade workshops of their deceased husbands. I wanna give you just a few examples in other materials. In London in 1383, Catherine Lightfoot is recorded as a supplier of 2,000 painted tiles for the king for his bath in Chini Palace. Municipal records in both London and Paris indicate that from the 14th to the 17th centuries, although their numbers were not great, women did work in the building trades as, next please, masons, carpenters, door makers, and in other crafts that required the worker to be present on the site. Here's an interesting anecdote. In the city of Lyon in France, a woman in prison for a crime in 1548 was recorded as Catherine Fremont, cabinet maker. Next, please. If we look to the Germanic kingdoms, there are numerous records of female glaziers in Nuremberg, these are the uh, window makers. However, in other Germanic cities, women were barred from glass cutting due to their supposed clumsiness and lack of skill. In 1605, the city council in Memmingen had to consider the case of a wife and daughter of a glazier who had been working outside their home. The glazier finally conceded that his wife really should be confined to work within the boundaries of their home but was pleading for his daughter to be allowed to work with him outside until she became married. Next slide. Now we need to ask, why haven't we heard much about women in the building trades before? There seem to be so many of them. I think it's simply because it is so hard to find them in the written record. So maybe the question we should really ask is, why is it so hard to find them? First off, women's work is often not recorded in historical records. Well, that makes it tough. I'm gonna to give you a good example. Some cities in Europe, a man could not establish a workshop unless he was married. With wives and daughters present in almost all workshops, female support of varying levels existed in trades. The historian Marian Wisner has noted that women's work was often uh, simply not seen as work. Thus was never recorded for tax or other purposes. Next, please. Another reason potentially is that when women's work is, is recorded, often very little information is provided, not even the women's names, even though this is not the case for men's work in the same source of information. There's a reason for this. Evidence for women's work could be seen to cast shame on them, especially manual labor, as was described in the written sources. These writers who come from the higher social classes insisted that women were not designed for hard labor, but evidently they weren't thinking about the lower classes, the slaves, the peasants, 
the agricultural workers, the servants, the urban working poor. These women couldn't adhere to the prescriptive vision of proper female behavior. Next, please. Poverty, much less the lives of poor women, just simply were not a subject of research until the late 20th century. Next, please. Lastly, there is no visual imagery as evidence, or virtually none. Imagery really could provide additional information. The text documents don't. Next slide, please. I'd like to leave you with a final image to ponder. This image is a woodcut printed by Peter Drakenspire in the late 15th century. It shows a husband and wife carrying a keystone which will complete the vault of the church. Are they patrons helping to build the church? Maybe they gave money? Or are they a husband and wife of a masonry workshop uh, basically demonstrated their pride and their craftsmanship? Well, actually, I tend to think they're probably patrons. And this is due to the husband's nice cap and his pointy shoes, which display his economic means. Um, but I almost like to think that this image is just a little ambiguous and might be open to interpretation. Next, please. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation on women in the building trades. I'd like to hand it over to Lisa Sasser now. Thank you, Dr. Roth. That was wonderful and fascinating, groundbreaking new information, I think, for a lot of us. It's so nice to be here today. And uh, can anyone think of a more iconic image of women in the trades? We can do it as an American World War II wartime poster produced by J. Howard Miller in 1943 for Westinghouse Electric as an inspirational image. Interestingly though, as familiar as it is to us today, it was not much seen until it was rediscovered early in the 1980s and widely produced in many forms and became something of a feminist icon. It's also called Rosie the Riveter, although it's not the Rosie the Riveter. But the fact that some 85 years later, this is sort of our predominant visual sense of what it means to be a woman in the trades. Even today, this is our sort of common cultural reference, but women in the trades continue to be represented in vanishingly small, almost invisible numbers. The trades have always been regarded as kind of a last frontier for women's career. Architecture, design, engineering have had significant increases in women's reputation. Architecture school enrollment is nearly half women in recent years. This trend has not made it to the construction site. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, around 99% of construction site workers are male. In 2018, the construction and extraction industries, only 3.4% of workers were women. 2.5% of tradespeople are women. To take carpenters as an example, in 2019, women only made up 2.8% of the carpenters in the United States. This means that out of uh, 1,300,000 roughly employed carpenters, only 36,176 were women. Still, 36,000 women is not a trivial number. So, as even though, as Dr. Roth reminds us, women have always been present in construction, we really don't have a way of representing them. There isn't a recognizable image of what it means to be a woman in the trades. I certainly don't relate to any of these images. And women's lack of representation is probably a contributor to their small numbers in the trades. Barriers to women's entry into the trades include a lack of exposure to the trades, a lack of awareness about the trades, a lack of encouragement to choose to work in the trades, fears of discrimination and toxic workplace culture, dirty and physically demanding work, the perception that it's not a quote unquote real career, 
and the idea that quote unquote smart people go to college and dumb people go into the trades. We're steadily eroding some of those preconceptions. But men and women alike fall victim to parental and peer pressure to go to college and tend to view trades work as dirty, dangerous, and lacking in prestige. It's just that women have the added backdrop and baggage of historical discrimination to turn them off. Women are present in fields like law enforcement, firefighting, corrections officers, in higher percentages than in construction. Even though those fields have often have demanding physical requirements. While women in the trades may be invisible in their reputation, they have found their voice in social media in a range of Facebook groups that provide support, networking, and infra information to women in the trades. Some of these groups include the National Association of Women in Construction, National Association of Professional Women in Construction, Women Construction Owners and Executives, the NH, NAHB Professional Women in Building Council, and groups like the National Association of Black Women in Construction. And women in preservation are increasingly represented in social media as well. Women in Preservation has a public group on Facebook with about uh, 1,200 members. And that group was originally started in 1984 as a ad hoc gathering of women in Washington, D.C in support of female leadership in preservation. Uh, framing women, a timber frame and log building discussion group for quote unquote girls was recently started by Autumn Peterson of the Timber Framers Guild and has taken off rapidly and is a wonderful resource. But let's talk for a minute about what it means to be in the traditional trades as opposed to the trades generally. The traditional building trades commonly include masonry, timber framing, log building, traditional roofing, carpentry, joinery, sometimes plumbing, plaster work, painting, blacksmithing, ornamental metalworking. In addition to hands-on skills and knowledge of building processes, traditional trade practitioners incorporate knowledge of historic preservation, material science, historic architecture, and procurement of replacement materials. Contemporary practitioners of traditional trades must also avail themselves of modern technologies, current material science, and 21st century construction project management. The work performed by these practitioners is not only essential to the maintenance of the historic built environment, but also to the preservation of traditional trade skills and knowledge. New construction focuses less on fabrication of building elements and more on installation and erection of manufactured and pre-engineering components. In 1853, when Ann Pamela Cunningham called on the ladies of America to save the home of George Washington, as it fell into ruin along the banks of the Potomac River, she probably didn't pause to consider whether there would be carpenters, masons, plasterers, painters, and joiners with the skills to restore it. Today, almost 170 years later, she would have marveled at somebody like Amy. Following publication of the Whitehill Report in 1968, a report which was commissioned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation to examine the shortage of architects and skilled tradespeople to work on America's architectural heritage. The National Park Service continued to evaluate the need for an in-house training program, and in 1977 established the Williamsport Preservation Training Center in Williamsport, Maryland, under the direction of James S. Askins, a preservation and National Park Service employee since 1963. The WPTC program consisted of a three-year training period executing hands-on project work on NPS historic structures throughout the national park system. A permanent staff of journeymen carpenters and masons were employed to train the interns, trainees enrolled in the program. Graduates filled position as preservation specialists and national park staffs, program centers, and regional offices. 
This program continues to operate as the NPS Historic Preservation Training Center in Frederick, Maryland. And my journey to Williamsport started in 1982 when I took a, a two-week masonry preservation and repointing class at the Piper Barn at Antietam, Maryland. Um, and I, I really had the, the desire to work with my hands. I've always liked working with my hands. So I called up Jim Askins one day and said, I want to enroll in the training program. And he said, okay, Toots, when do you want to start? So in 1984, I became the first woman trainee in the uh, hands-on training program at Williamsport. And as you might imagine, it was a very different world in those days. It was very much male enclave. And just a short anecdote will give you a sense of what it was like. We had an old carpenter named Roshitz, who was a really grumpy old man, but he was what was known as a hell of a mechanic, meaning he was an outstanding carpenter and tradesperson. And his role was to basically uh, indoctrinate the newbies, the new trainees. So I was put to work with the old man building doors. At the end of the day, I realized that he could cut all my stock half an inch too narrow. So when everybody left, I buried it all in the back room and spent the night at the shop and totally recut and remade the doors. And when everyone came in the next morning, they were lying out on horses. The old man came in and he looked at him and he stormed upstairs to Askin's office. And I heard him yelling and hollering up there. Askin's came down, pointed at me, said, get up here, get up in my office. He closed the door and he said to me, why didn't you tell me the old man was giving you a hard time? He said, I ain't never seen the old man so worked up about anything. And I said, Jim, if I would have come to you and said, I can't work with that old man, he's being mean to me, what would you have thought? So at any rate, I persevered through the program and remained on the staff at the Williamsport Preservation Training Center for another 10 years, and then went on to further positions with the National Park Service. And in retrospect, there's not a thing I would have done differently. And it was certainly one of the most exceptional and formative experiences in my life, and it certainly set me on a path in the preservation trades, which I've never regretted for a moment. So let's think for a minute, how do women get into the trades? Frequently through a family member or family business, although women were often discouraged from following male family members' occupations. Pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs while apprenticeships in, are the traditional path to jobs in the skilled trades, entry into apprenticeship programs is sometimes dependent on access to information about when, where, and how to apply, as well as the training skills necessary for particular occupations. Access to such information has historically been tightly controlled, controlled by workers who are overwhelmingly male. This has helped perpetuate what has been described by female construction workers as the FBI, or Friends, Brothers, and In-Laws Network, which operates to exclude women and minorities and illustrates the insular nature of the trades. Careers in technical and technical education have been a route to women's involvement in the trades, and frequently non-traditional apprenticeships and on-the-job learning. An interest in historic preservation or home restoration, leading to a desire to, for people to do hands-on work themselves is another route. So exposure through groups like the Preservation Trades Network, Timber Framers Guild, and Window Restoration Alliance has also been an important way for women to become more visible and to see the presence of women in the trades. Attendance at events like the National or the uh, Preservation Trades Network International Preservation Trades Workshop, which has been offered annually since 1997, has been a great source of visibility for women in the trades. 
And interestingly enough, the Preservation Trades Network started off as an outgrowth of the Association for Preservation Technology. And while there were many tradespeople that were involved in APT, there was a sense that tradespeople didn't feel altogether represented at APT events. And I remember going to events and seeing presentations that started off with these wonderful projects where you saw the building prior to restoration and the building after restoration, but you never really got a sense of what happened in between or the role of the trades in making this happen. When tradespeople complained about their lack of visibility within APT, it was pointed out quite rightly that tradespeople tended not to want to get up and talk and make presentations. So PTN was formed with the idea of how do you get preservation tradespeople to talk? You put tools in their hands, and typically if you put tools in their hands, they never shut up. Another route for people to learn about and become engaged in the preservation trades has been through field schools, such as the Pacific Northwest Preservation Field School, which has been offered since 1995 in spots throughout the Pacific Northwest and has become a great launching pad for preservationists. Many graduates of the University of Oregon's preservation program got their start at the Pacific Northwest Field School. Another venerable field school, the Preservation Institute Nantucket, which although not directly trades oriented, has certainly offered visibility of the importance of traditional trade skills through its program on Nantucket Island since 1972, which is one of the oldest continually operating field schools for historic preservation. Another route is crossover from another field. Many people come to the traditional trades as a second career, sometimes through architecture, art, historic preservation, or other programs. The median age of students in programs like the North Bennett Street School is mid 40s. Many people have felt pressure to have a conventional career before following their hearts and in getting into the trades. A number of people complete professional degrees and then pursue additional training in a trade. Mentors can also be a big influence. Mentors don't have to be women, but it would certainly be beneficial to have more women as mentors and role models in the trade. And finally, in recent years, the emergence of outstanding academic programs such as the American College of the Building Arts in South Carolina, the first four-year college in the United States that offers career tracks in the preservation trades. Belmont Tech College in Ohio has been in existence since the early 80s and has been a very influential source of training in the trades. The Bryn Athen college program in Pennsylvania, which unfortunately I think has recently ceased to operate. Class of Community College in Oregon, Edgecombe Community College in North Carolina, the North Bennett Street School in Massachusetts, Savannah Technical College, and Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Also another, a number of training programs and advocacy groups for the traditional trades and trades preservation technology exist, such as the Association for Preservation Technology International, Preservation Maryland's Campaign for the Historic Trades, which is having a huge mark in the field, Columbus Landmarks Window Warriors Program, Cornerstones Community Partnerships in New Mexico, Historicor and the Hope Crew, the National Park Service Historic Preservation Training Center, the National Park Service National Center for Preservation Training and Technology, the Western Center for Historic Preservation, Northern Bedrock Historic Preservation Corps, PTN, and the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, Building Arts and Traditional Architecture Program. Interestingly enough, the heritage trades have a much higher profile in Great Britain than they do in this country. 
and have been actively engaged in trying to recruit young people into the pr traditional trades. The Construction Industry Training Board, CITB, is the industry training board for the construction sector in England. And in 19, or, I'm sorry, 2005, they completed a traditional craft skills report, which pointed out the shortages in young people entering the preservation and heritage trades. So the National Heritage Training Group conducted research on how to get young people interested in traditional trades. So they conducted a poll of high school students about what they were most interested in. And not surprisingly, the results indicated that it was something along the lines of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So their recruitment program for the traditional trades somewhat subtly mirrored those interests. And some of the posters portrayed women in the traditional trades, but I always thought this was a particularly clever and creative way to recruit people into the trades. And the uh, British actually start educating children about careers in construction from a very early age. And this wonderfully named industry group in Britain, the Considerate Constructors Scheme, has a website enabling children to discover a wealth of career opportunities available in construction. So how do you get kids interested in traditional trades? Put tools in their hands early and often. With these girls, if she can see it, she can be it. These girls may grow up to become our next generation of tradespeople. And I hope the future of the traditional trades looks a lot like them. Thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, uh, Preservation Maryland, for inviting me onto this program. Um, so I will be discussing uh, kind of how I uh, came to be the preservation joiner at Mount Vernon. Um, and my story starts here with my grandmother, who was a very powerful force in my life. Um, we, we had property adjoining, um, the farm, the, the family farm, and she, uh, was my babysitter after my mom and dad went back to work. Um, so I spent a great deal of time with her. Uh, she's a very strong willed, um, powerful woman. And she fed my love of history from a very early age. And, um, she pretty much, uh, shaped kind of. Uh, my early beginnings um, with uh, working with my hands. Um, she's a, she was an artist, and uh, we she did teach me how to paint with oils and do the traditional fine arts. Um, but she, they also both my grandmother and my grandfather um, taught me, you know, how to build uh, chicken coops, how to work with the hammer, you know, all those farm things that um, you learn as you're growing up. Um, and I, I, I don't, I can't remember how old I was. I, I approached her and I said, you know, I really love archaeology. I've got history and finding all the things in the ground and seeing all that. And she looked at me and she said, well, there's no money in that profession. <laughs> um, so I was a little deterred at that point um, about that. But in the end, uh, I, I, I did go to college. I have a bachelor's of arts um, from the University of Oregon uh, in fine arts and that that profession certainly has a good deal of money <laughs> coming in. Um, so I quickly floundered after I graduated, um, not really understanding that to be an artist, really, you have to be a business as a self as a freelance artist. And I certainly didn't have business experience. So after some flip flopping around, I ended up in Portland, Oregon. And I was working with a general contractor. Um, and he, you know, God bless him, he hired five women for one summer to work with him. And, um, you know, he kept 
I stayed on with him after the summer and worked with him for about seven years. But there, there came a point uh, during my early time with him where it sucked. I tell you what, it was, it was a horrible, I was having a horrible time and I really questioned whether or not I wanted to pursue this uh, any further than the next day, the next year, or the rest of my life. And I was in my 20s. I was, I was, I was having trouble keeping up with the other workers. I wasn't strong enough yet, and I didn't have quite the knowledge uh, that I do now, certainly. Um, and I had gone home, and I was eating my dinner out of out of a pot, and I was watching PBS, and a show came on, and I became instantly fascinated with this story. And it was a video about the restoration of Windsor Castle after it burned down. It was narrated by uh, Prince Charles and several other um, notable notable names. And about, I would say 30 minutes in, and I've just recently gone back to this film to see it again and see if it had the same power that it did when I first saw it. And about at 30 minutes into the film, they show these traditional joiners um, using traditional tools, working the oak uh, that went into the, the hammer beam ceiling of Windsor Castle. And I was like, damn, I want to do that. How do I learn how to do that? And so the next, and you know, I thought to myself, well, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go in the next day and you're going to have to figure it out and figure out how you're gonna survive um, and take as much knowledge as you can from this opportunity and just realize that that's a stepping stone for the next opportunity. Um, and so, you know, the, the love of hand tools and working with hands um, was a, a big draw for me in uh, going into historic preservation. And after about the seven years that I was with him, I decided to break away and start my own company. And that's when I started Oculus Fine Carpentry, which um, I'm known as. Uh, and I had that business for over 20 years, namely focusing on windows and sash restoration. Um, and it was it was more as more like pure dumb luck that I went into windows specifically. Uh, I put all my business cards at a window shop, so obviously all my calls are about windows. And at the time, there weren't too many companies doing restoration work of windows. There was a lot of um, replacement, but there wasn't a lot of restoration. And so my phone immediately was very busy, and I remained busy um, until, until I left uh, Oregon. Um, there came a point, uh, I would say, five or six years into my business, I started to get known by the State Historic Preservation Office and I was asked to work on my first um, uh, his, uh, founder's home, I would call it. It's, it's a home, it's an early settlement home in Oregon where the founder of the, of the town built this house in 1856. And there was grant money involved and it was owned by a nonprofit. So there was a lot of people involved with this and it was very different than the residential work that I was accustomed to. And this is my second um, pivotal moment in my career came at this um, property. And I, while I was working on the, on the windows, there was also a timber framer there named uh, David Rogers. And we were in a meeting and um, some of these windows were, had been replaced with vinyl. And so they wanted to quote for having them um, you know, put back as they would have looked. And so myself, in my naive way, went to, you know, the local window shop and got a quote for them to machine make, um, you know, I think six pairs of of sash. And I and I brought the quote to the meeting and David looked over and he said, those windows should really be hand built because not only are you providing a product in keeping with the character of the house, you're also keeping a dying craft alive. And that last part, keeping the dying craft alive, that stuck with me like like nothing else. And at the at in the moment I was like, 
gosh, I don't know. I don't know how to make windows by hand. Um, I would, and so my journey started um, with that sentence and I slowly started to accumulate the knowledge through reading books, um, looking at the windows themselves and slowly amassing the hand tools necessarily necessary to do that. Um, and the beginnings were quite humble compared to my plane collection currently. Um, as you can see in this photo, this was the extent of my my planes. And there I am in my little workshop <laughs> um, working on windows. And I did not sell off most of my power tools until I was able to build planes. The planes that you see in the photograph on this left side that are that are a little lighter in color are the ones that um, I learned how to build. And once I learned how to build for each profile of sash, I was comfortable in selling off um, probably 99% of my power tools. And from this point forward, I went entirely, uh, you know, I did have an occasional power drill, but most of the time I was 100% unplugged on a job site. And you can imagine the gawking and the ridicule that comes with that, but um, it was it was always fun to um, uh, go a little faster than than the power. Uh, so as you can imagine, um, you know, being in such a very unique niche of work sent me to some fabulous places in my career. Um, this is the uh, Sumter Valley Gold Dredge, where I did um, new trim around the sash and uh, new sills. This is Fort Dalles. It's an early settlement frontier fort. This is the only building left surviving from a larger complex. Um, the rest of the structures have burned to the ground and I restored all the sash um, in this structure. Uh, and this is its sister fort in Yakima, um, actually White Swan. This is Fort Simcoe. And then it was after this point that the the lighthouses started to um, pop up uh, uh, for me. I've worked on seven projects on six lighthouses in Oregon and Washington State. The first being Hasita Head. Um, although beautiful and uh, what you might think would be idyllic uh, work site is actually dirty and nasty and cold. And um, I do not miss working on these guys. Um, they're very technical. And uh, I had to build uh, frames and sash for this lighthouse and for North Head, which uh, will be the next slide. Uh, they're all arch tops. So they're very complicated, very complicated joinery, um, very taxing. Um, so yes, they are beautiful, but they're very, very difficult to work on. This is North Head. This is the very last lighthouse that I worked on uh, before I left for the East Coast. And here's another shot of the interiors um, of this. And so all of this led to um, a, my current position, which is here at Mount Vernon. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to present at a window conference on how to build windows by hand. And I there met the former um, architectural conservator for Mount Vernon. And he was very intrigued with what I did. And I would say three months later, he uh, called me and said, oh, by the way, do you do doors? I said, oh, of course I do doors. <laughs> yeah, well, what do you need? And so I was asked to build six doors for Mount Vernon in 2017. And that's when I made my first journey um, to the site. And um, I made four, uh, two pairs of batten doors and then these doors, which will be eventually placed on the East Central Passage of the mansion. Um, exhausting, absolutely. Um, very rewarding work. And um, 
I think, as far as I know, I am the first and um, only female that's ever held the position of preservation joiner at Mount Vernon. And as you can imagine, um, that carries a very great weight to it, but it is a weight that I gladly carry um, and am infinitely uh, humble and proud to, to be here. And for, for those out there wondering if historic preservation is the right course, or even if trades is the right course, um, I would say a couple things. Um, my my college degree, which I thought at the time was useless and a waste of money, eventually came around to be a great asset for me here and in my in my business with documentation. And you can see some of the documentation that I do. Um, and I would also say that don't be adverse to exploring and learning new um, new things. And I was fortunate enough to have a very good friend who taught me how to do wood ID microscopically, which again, at the time I was like, I don't know if I'll ever use this, but down the road, it definitely can't, comes in handy. And don't be afraid to be unique um, and stand out. Uh, it's definitely uh, gotten me uh, a fairly colorful life, and, um, and, but it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard road at times. But, um, I wouldn't have it any other way. So I think that's my last slide and I will turn it over to Jessica. Thank you guys so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been a very inspiring um, afternoon. Um, so just as a reminder that um, if you would like to ask a question of any of the panelists, um and we we don't really have the ability to do um vocal questions but please put out in the chat box and we will be um happy to i'll be happy to field those questions to the panelists um so the first one actually we had two kind of variations on the same thing um so and i know we your presentation talked a bit about training programs which may have covered some of this but the question was about um, people who may want to do this um, later in life, like a lot of the traditional crafts program aiming at college students or high school students or, you know, younger people, um, where would you advise people looking to maybe start this as a second career um, or beyond kind of the college age level to start with exploring this career option? Well, I'll tackle that. I would say, <laughs> first off, uh, talk to as many people as you can go to a conference or a workshop and start to evaluate some of the possibilities that are open. Join a join an organization like uh, EPT, the Timber Framers Guild, the Preservation Trades Network, and then maybe uh, go to some workshops, some hands-on uh, opportunities, possibly find a field school to participate in, and then decide if it's for you and if whether or not to take the next step of going into a uh, more formal training or apprenticeship program. Um, so the other question is actually on the flip side of that. Um, so what it is, would you, uh, we have someone who is preparing career, career presentation to an area high school for area high school students and was wondering what advice you would give high school students as they consider different career options. Well, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, look at trades. Uh, there's so much more opportunities than when I started. Um, the ACBA is amazing, and I wish I had known about it or or had been around when I was, um, you know, floundering around. Um, so I would definitely, um, you know, look towards the trades. It's it's certainly um, a very rewarding and fulfilling career. And you know, I you know I've always wondered about the um, the stigma of the trades with um, parents because I have I did have um, a apprentice um, or employee when I was when I was working and um, you know uh, it was expected that this person was to go on to college and not take up trades that was just you know it wasn't an option that they needed to go to college and and you know find a profession that they perceive you know, that the parents perceive as making money. Um, and so I don't know how to uh, 
advise people on if like a young person if they've getting pushed back from parents about going into the trades uh you know i don't i'm unsure as to what advice i can give for that but maybe lisa or shelly has advice on that or you know, in general i think that the uh, profile of the trade certainly the traditional trades has has gotten higher i mean there's so much good information via youtube and the web and the american college of the building arts has just been such a breakthrough in how people perceive i think the value of the trades i know that the course of my career would have probably been very different if some of these opportunities would have been available when i was just getting out of high school even though i don't regret having a degree in architecture i always regarded it as really good preparation for doing something else yeah i can add something to that too you know my um my parents insisted i go to college i had no choice i tried all kinds of science majors but i ended up in architecture because the artist in me just loves hands-on things and um you know you can go to college now in programs in construction science management in historic preservation and they often have design build projects that students work on and that is in a sense an introduction to trades you know kind of secondhand but but you will get exposed to it and the people that you meet through that can lead you into actual trades. And so there's a, just a possibility there. My friend, Rudy Christian, who's a timber framer, always said that within the heart of every doctor, lawyer, and broker, there's a timber framer yearning to break free. So I yeah. think there's a lot to the idea that uh, once people know that the trades exist, and that they're an option. There's a lot more interest and desire to participate in them. Yeah. I'd also like to add um, there's Youth Service Corps, and Preservation Maryland is trying to set up one that's preservation specific and trade specific, but there are other options out there. They integrate well into college classes too, so you can do it during the summer. So you can go and, you know, earn while you learn. And uh, you also get some educational scholarships at the end. So those are a good way to kind of toe dip and see if it's something you want. Um, and I also was a career changer. I have my degree in history and then made the pivot. <laughs> so I think higher ed isn't incompatible at all. I have a question for Amy, if I can ask. Of course. It, it's two questions. Yep. One, I was very curious when you talked about moving from power tools to hand tools, because um, mm -hmm. I also study archaeologically um, um, construction tools. So when you made that move, um, I'm just curious, it, was it harder to work with the hand tools? Did you like it or not like it? You know, kind of what was that experience like? Um, I would say I, uh, I loved it. Um, and I love the the tools themselves. You know, it's it's a lot of eye candy. Um, yeah. And but I will tell you that when I first sold the tools and started building sash by hand, there was definitely a very steep learning curve because I was accustomed and of uh, building sash with machinery and that sequence of 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 um, you know, manipulating of the wood is very different when you're using hand tools. So when I first started, I I love planes. And so I went right ahead and jumped into running, you know, my glazing rabbit and my profile. But then I didn't I didn't understand that to, to cut your mortise and tenons, you're going to have to, you know, have the, the profile and the rabbit kind of riding on your bench in a rock, rocking it's a rickety rockety sort of uh thing and so you know it was through more education on my part um going back and figuring out um the sequencing so where i could be efficient and what i didn't say was during his seat ahead um i 
built six pairs of arch top window sash in two weeks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I was a bit under the gun with the schedule and they had to be done. And so I made it happen, but I would not recommend going that fast, but my, the wood shop, the mechanical wood shop get, would, could do it in three. And so I do feel like the hand tools have kind of this perception of slowing down or, you know, you're, you're, you're just fiddling around, whereas the power tools are, you know, fast and quick and we can get it done. But I will, I will tell you that once you have your sequencing and um, your understanding of the hand tools, you can be very efficient with uh, your process and go as fast or faster than a power tool. So that would be my advice on that. That's amazing to know. And my second question is, um, if there is a young woman who may be watching our seminar um, is intrigued with making windows, and I know you're self-taught, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to that young woman on how to get started? Um, well, there are some, there's nowadays there are some classes you can take on building windows by hand. I know Roy Underhill teaches one and there are a couple workshops around short, shorter courses that will teach you some basics. I would, uh, I would say even if it's not building, but just restoring and learning about how they're put together would, is a great advantage if you want to eventually learn how to build them. Um, you know, go down, you know, people are removing them still, their historic um, sash, you know, go down to your local, um, I don't want to say dump site, but, uh, you know, rebuilding center or restore, pick up an old window and, look, you know, take it home and study it. Like, what are these join? what's this joinery look like? How do you make this joinery? Um, and then at that point, I would advise learning how to join wood together namely mortise and tenons, because that is what you will be doing a lot of if you decide to build windows. Um, and Natalie can speak towards this because I taught her how to build windows in Savannah. <laughs> um, so those would be some of my uh, immediate things that I would advise. Also, you know, search around for, for textbooks. Um, there's old woodworking books that are around. The Adele series is great just to get some idea about how um, windows are put together. And, you know, they're great for just general carpentry. Like, how do you use a, a plane properly? Or how do you use a handsaw properly? Um, will greatly, um, you know, if they do want to go into hand tools use, I would start there. Um, we have, I know there is a question about um, getting a list of the organizations for women in construction and preservation that you mentioned in your presentation, Lisa. Um, mm -hmm. so I think what I could say to that is if I can work with you, Lisa, to get a list together, we can include that as part of our email. Um, so for anyone who joined late or, um, uh, was just, uh, zoning out during my intro talk, which I don't blame you because these are the lovely ladies you're here to listen to. Um, so I, uh, uh, we did record this session and, um, we will be getting an email over the next couple of days with that recording um, and that will also have information on all the speakers because so know that um, we do some of the links up for more information about them in the chat but um, this will kind of give you a get to know everybody better uh, as well as we can compile the list because that wasn't access you had in your presentation Lisa. Um, so we have an interesting question uh, back to the kind of career change so people that may have been doing anything um, and finally releasing that uh, inner trades person that's been lurking uh, for so long. Um, how are they, how, some advice on finding that transition. So um, like if you see people in your experience, you've seen people that save money, quit their job and then tackle the classes. If it's possible to do apprenticeship while they're continuing um, their other job, like just how the financial end of that, how that works. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> And if the answer is everyone's different, I don't know, that's also a valid answer. But if there's any advice or anything like that, uh, let us know. I, 
Yeah. Well, I would encourage people who are interested in doing that to get involved with some of these uh, networking groups on social media and start putting the question out there and start using those as resources to find jobs, to find leads on where to go and how to make that transition because there is a huge amount of opportunities for networking now on social media that simply didn't exist a few years ago. So that might be a place to start. And there are uh, resources like uh, PreserveNet from uh, Cornell that uh, keeps an up-to-date listing of vacancies and uh, training program announcements, that kind of thing. So try to get plugged in as much as possible to all of the sources for information and networking. Thank you. Did you have something to add, Natalie? Yeah, yeah. I, I personally took a leap of faith. I worked at a casino um, before doing historic preservation. Um, and I made decent enough money. I was able to save up and take a dive into it and just moved cold to Savannah to attend school. Um, I don't think I could have done it without casino money beforehand. <laughs> it was um, It was hard at first. And there's plenty of work out there once you get tapped in. And I didn't have that network at all in my home state of Oklahoma, but by going to school, I got that network. So I think what Lisa's point is networking is great. There's also you know, a way to do that and not move cities and spend your life savings is taking like a workshop and seeing who you can talk to and get connected that way, see if you wanna do it. And then I'll plug, Preservation Maryland again in the campaign, but we're working on an apprenticeship tracks for this so that if you are sure you want to do it, but not sure if you could do the learning financially, we're trying to integrate it. So you could be working on a job and learning and then also earning a degree towards historic preservation, the hands-on trades. Um, partly based on my own experiences being very poor and going to school and needing education and training. So to, that's a rolling out probably within this year. Thank you so much. Um, we had another question in, and um, like I said, if you keep the questions coming, if we can't get to them all, um, we can always follow up on some of them offline as well. Um, so one of us, do you have any recommendations for books or trainings by women, trans or non-binary people to get into or expand on their building trades knowledge? I don't know about books. But there is a program I know, I think in California and San Francisco, and pardon me saying it, but it is the name of the group. It's called, um, I think, Dykes with Drills, and it's for um, non-binary or LGBTQ, not men, <laughs> um, to get into the construction trades. I think it's just localized, but I think there are those type of movements kind of cropping up around. Um, but yeah, I'm not personally sure of any books if the rest of you are? I don't know of any books, but there are uh, groups on social media like the Rainbow Heritage Network, which although not particularly trades oriented, does offer some resources for the LBGTQI community as far as preservation. Um, we did have a couple chat um, ideas on uh, those and mentorship programs. One was the National Preservation Institute um, mentioned there's a, a course on restoring historic windows and also the Window um, Preservation, I'm sorry, Window Preservation Alliance had a mentorship program as well. So those were mentioned in our chat as additional resources. Um, uh, so let me see, uh, here's a good question. Uh, have you heard of a program that seeks to attract police as a group to train in the trades? Who? What was the question again? Yeah, so it's, um, it's asking about if there's a program to attract parolees in the trades. Um, through the Youth Service Corps, one of the ideas is attracting um, 
it, one of the components is sometimes trying to work with at-risk youth. Um, and I know Job Corps has something similar. I don't know of very specifically programs geared towards that, but it is a component of some of the Youth Service Corps. But it is also limited to 18 to 30 year olds, so not necessarily beyond. Um, we had a comment in, um, I think leads to kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting question that's a little bit of a flip on some of the um, advice we've had on destigmatizing the idea of going into trades, that it was someone whose father would pay for their college as long as they went into humanities, they pay for a BA, they pay for an MA as long as they went into a certain field, but would not pay for them to go into trades. So what would your advice, like what kind of arguments could you maybe uh, steal an aspiring preservationist with um, to go in and uh, make that case that they should be supported um, just as much as other field? I would say the the price of college these days and the debt load you come out with Absolutely. for going through and at least getting a bachelor's is atrocious. And I can't even imagine graduate school. Um, my daughters are approaching that faster than I would like. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'm a concerned parent about it. And, and you know, I know that, um, you know, some of the trades programs are not as expensive, um, and there are scholarship opportunities for those. Uh, so I would maybe <laughs> look towards the money aspect of that if you're trying to build an argument for that. I think also, you know, it, it's it's evident that uh, there are a lot of people in the trades that are working at extraordinarily high levels of skill and craftsmanship in high profile positions with very important and significant historic sites and i mean those are inspirational this is not like digging a ditch or being some laborer on a anonymous job site somewhere this is this is significant and it's meaningful and i think it can be an impressive persuasion device for somebody that doesn't realize the range of the of the of the trades yeah i was just thinking something along those lines that you know when you go to a trade school it is an education in a lifelong profession that can become a passion and that's not guaranteed when you go to university you know and i feel like somewhere like the american college of building arts it, it it is almost part of the humanities because there is a study of art and architecture and traditional styles and history. Um, I think trying to separate those two is kind of um, uh, not correct. Oh, here's another new one in, but um, we did also, I just wanted to say that um, uh, we have someone here from the Northern Bedrock Historic Preservation Corps who appreciated the shout out uh, and say they're doing their best to engage young adults in the preservation trades with an eye towards open pathway careers. So thank you for that. Um, and so, yeah, then another comment I think about um, kind of people that are maybe over 30 and, and looking to transition, um, um, and so we'll make that list that Lisa mentioned, both of networking, but also different training programs. Um, we can share that in the email, um, just with a general comment that it would be great an expansion of kind of maybe second career kind of opportunities, uh, things geared at that, um, at that cohort. I don't know if anyone has comments on like any final comments on um, the career switch and, and uh, opportunities and potential growth, if there is any potential growth for those opportunities. Well, I have a comment really directed towards Lisa, um, and it's just a comment, but I was noticing the parallels between our talks, and I can't say how important it is that young women get to see visual imagery of women holding the tools engaged in the trade with guys around 
you know, it, it psychologically it makes such a difference when the visual imagery gets out there, when there's live presentations of women doing things um, and virtual presentations. And now they're, you know, close enough. <laughs> Not quite the same as being able to get your hands on the tools too. Um, but if you want to encourage young women, um, this is one avenue to, to sort of change the way they think about things. Mm -hmm. You just see the women doing it. And I think uh, we do have one more question that is kind of in along those lines is, um, what is the future of maybe um, all this exposure to women in trades and having uh, it just become a part, part um, the shift of people from uh, maybe working in particular from kind of the more preservation management type career into more preservation trades type careers? It can be, it can be tough. One thing that I found in my career was that after I went through the preservation trades training program at HPTC, I wasn't, it was very difficult to remain in the trades. And it was sort of like there was this attitude, it's like, okay, you had your fun, we've indulged you, now it's time that you go back into the office and start doing what you're really supposed to be doing. So you really have to fight against that even when you start to break in and find ways to work in the trades. You have to fight sometimes to stay centered in the trades. I don't know if that answers the question, but it sort of goes in the same direction. I had a same experience where an employer pretty much straight up told me they expected me to move to into the office within a year because that's what all the women did um and and yeah encountering several of those employers and people at with that attitude um seeing somebody like Amy with their own business and I was like okay if she can do it I can do it <laughs> um so that was actually one of my inspirations for just doing it on my own well, uh, you were you were a great student, and I'm glad that I was able to uh, will help you out along the way. Um, but yeah, it it can be hard sometimes. It can be very hard. Um, I've had to put up a, with a lot of, you know, disparaging comments and, um, you know, non-respect from a lot of people through my career. And, you know, I just got to let it roll off my back. I can't let it get to me. And I have to just keep focus on, I love these tools. I'm going to make this work. And I just need to put one foot in front of the other um, to get it done. So uh, it's not easy um, at times. I think it is getting better, though. I certainly see that looking back on my career and my history. Things are changing. And the visibility of women in the trades is light years beyond what it was when I was went into the apprenticeship program. I didn't know anybody that was doing that. So I mean it was it was kind of kind of lonely, really. Well thank you guys so much. I this these have all been just such wonderful and inspiring um presentations. I really, really appreciate you bringing all of your experiences and wisdom to share with us today. Um, again, if you um, if you are registered for this uh, for this presentation, that means you will be getting an e email from us soon with a recording of the presentation. Please feel free to share. Um, it'll also be up on our website. Um, and I think getting yeah that list of um, networking groups and training resources will be fantastic. Um, so I appreciate everyone who joined us, everyone who asked questions, and especially, especially all of our panelists uh, for being here today to share their wisdom. Thank you guys so much. This was really, really fantastic. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for well, having thank you. And thanks to uh, Preservation Maryland for hosting this program. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you all and have a great afternoon.